Hello and welcome. My name is Abby. Welcome to Wisteria Lane. And I'm here today to talk about Desperate Housewives. Also, I want to thank Mike's Mike, who's Pretty Little Liars video I stumbled upon. If you've never watched any of Mike's Mike's videos, he does a different gimmick each time he covers a new show. It's super fun. Um, but with Pretty Little Liars, he did this like detective board on his wall connecting all the different characters on the show. And since Desperate Housewives is also a mystery, I wanted to do the same thing. So there's a lot of different colors here and I'll talk more about what they all mean, but this is just season one. And without further ado, um, Let's, let's go. <laughs> Desperate Housewives originally aired on ABC and it premiered on October 3rd, 2004. It was created by Mark Cherry, who had this idea to create a show about what really goes on in the lives of so-called perfect suburban housewives. And it was said to sort of be a combination of Sex and the City, Melrose Place, and Twin Peaks. A whopping 21.6 million people watched the premiere on October 3rd, 2004. Which, in like modern day, is just crazy to think about. Specifically, I think it's crazy because... We don't know how many people are viewing TV shows anymore. I do know from my research for this video that Desperate Housewives was the most commonly pirated TV show of its run, but we still have like a rough estimate, you know, of how many people tuned in. And nowadays we have all these streaming services and like they tell us something's in the top 10 on their website, but no one you know is talking about it and no one you know is watching it and like, and it also sucks that we don't know how many people are watching things because we can't properly hold them accountable for doing things like removing shows from their service or canceling shows with no notice, even if it's already all been filmed. Um, and for not properly paying their actors and writers and creative teams. Anyways. A lot of people watched this show, and to help put things in context for you, I want you to remember that 2004 was also the year that on ABC, Grey's Anatomy premiered as well as Lost, and those were both cultural phenomenons. But Desperate Housewives was still the number one show on ABC for most of its run. Okay, so what is Desperate Housewives? It is a drama comedy, but also a mystery, but also a soap opera. Um, it kind of defies genre. Everyone on Wisteria Lane has secrets. Everyone has baggage. Everyone has a past. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of each episode. With the exception of, I believe, two or maybe three episodes in its entire run, the show is narrated by Mary Alice Young, who was a resident of Wisteria Lane. We will get into her storyline as soon as we dive into season one. It's pretty similar to Sex and the City, where Carrie is uh, narrating each episode. Um, or Grey's Anatomy, where Meredith Grey has the opening and closing, but not a whole lot in the middle. Mary Alice tends to be the same way. She only tells us the things that are really important, and sometimes it makes commentary on what's happening in the women's lives, which is kind of fun. To talk about the pilot, I'm going to take you one main character at a time and talk about how they are introduced and tell you a little bit about them. You can note the most important characters on the show, by these lovely little colored borders I gave them. Um, more women will be introduced as the show goes on, but these are the core six that the show follows. I love most of them. The pilot episode opens with Mary Alice Young talking us through a day in her ordinary life. She is a very normal housewife. Um, she wakes up and has her breakfast and then tends to her garden and touches up some paint on a chair, and then she goes into her closet and takes down a shoebox, pulls out a gun, and shoots herself in the head. This is Mary Alice Young, BT Dubs. This is Martha Huber. 
Now, Martha Hoover hears the gunshot from Mary Alice's house, and she's nosy. She's so nosy. So she goes on over, and she peers through the window, and she sees Mary Alice's dead body sprawled on the floor. Oh, before she goes over, though, she needs an excuse to go snoop, right? You can't just go to your neighbor when you hear a gunshot. You have to find a good reason. So she opens up her cupboard, and she takes out this blender that has a label Mary Alice Young on it. She fucking borrowed the blender. Anyways, she goes to return the blender that she borrowed forever ago. She runs over to Mary Alice's and peers through the window and then sees her dead body. She calls 911 and tells them that uh, her neighbor shot herself and that they need help. And then she goes home. She takes off the label. She puts the blender in her cupboard and shuts the door because she just scored herself a blender, man. We're introduced to the rest of the women during Mary Alice's post-funeral reception. So first up, we have Susan Meyer. Susan is a divorcee. She is also a children's book illustrator. Her ex-husband is named Carl, and he left her when he had an affair with a secretary. And they have a daughter, Julie, who is 12, I think, at the start of the pilot. Now, Susan, she's kind of the flop of the friend group, right? She brings mac and cheese to the wake. It's not good. Mike tries some of it, and um, I'll tell you more about Mike in a second, but I just want you to know he had some of Susan's mac and cheese. He says that the mac and cheese tastes burnt and undercooked at the same time. She's clumsy and she's a people pleaser, but yeah, she's kind of just like the flop, the divorcee, um, the single mom. So during the pilot, Wisteria Lane gets a new resident, Mike Delfino. Mike is a plumber by trade, and Susan is very interested in Mike. Now, Julie, she encourages her mom to go after him because how long has it been since her mom had sex? Come on! Julie is truly the parent here, and it's really upsetting as the series goes on, but she does stand up for herself a few times, and I always pointed it out in my notes. Susan decides in the pilot to go on over to Mike's and ask him to dinner. But on the way, <laughs> I'm so excited, she meets Edie Britt. Edie Britt, according to Mary Alice Young's voiceover, is the most predatory divorcee in the five block radius. Edie has definitely become one of my favorite housewives, especially as I've gotten older. I don't know, I just think she's fun. She's just fun. She's just silly. Mary Alice refers to Edie not only as the predatory one, she refers to Edie as the enemy. And <laughs> she has this voiceover that's like, yes, Susan had met the enemy. And she was a slut. Edie hops on over like her tits are out. And she asks Mike if he can come over and look at her pipes. So obviously Susan is pretty upset because how is she going to beat Edie Britt when she's a flop and she's a slut? Later on, Susan runs back over to Mike's. And Edie's already there and they're just eating a, a little welcome to the neighborhood dinner together. She needs to get Edie out of Mike's house, like now. So she tells Mike that she has a plumbing emergency. And then she runs back home while he grabs his toolbox. She takes Julie's school project, which is a bunch of popsicle sticks made to look like a, I think it's supposed to be like a Trojan horse or something. And she stuffs it down the sink. <laughs> So Mike comes over and he's like, you have a bunch of sticks in your sink. That might be the problem. And she was like, oh, Julie, she's always playing in the kitchen. Mind you, Julie's literally raising her mother, right? Later on in the episode, Susan finds out from Martha Hoover. Remember, this is this is Martha up here. Um, and she's nosy. She's gossip. That, um, that Edie is having a gentleman caller over that evening. So Susan obviously assumes it's got to be Mike. Like, she's too late. They're already about to do it. Susan wants to sabotage it. So she's gonna go ask good old Edie for some sugar. Um, she goes over with her glass measuring cup. She goes into the house, lets herself right in. And she's too late. She hears Edie with her, her gentleman caller. Susan sits down on the couch to pout and she sees Edie's lingerie on the floor and she picks it up and she throws it back over her shoulder because she's so disappointed that she lost her chance at the hot plumber. The underwear lands on a candle. It lights up the curtains. And Edie's house burns down. Susan just fucking runs, but 
She leaves the measuring cup behind. As the fire is being put out, we see all the residents of Wisteria Lane gathering outside of Edie's, like across the street, you know, to watch the firefighters work. And like, they're so stressed about what's happening in their neighborhood. And then Mike shows up and asks if everything's okay, which means he was not the one with Edie after all. So kind of a win. And then to round things out with Mike for the episode, he goes home and he is on a phone call. He is looking out the window and says that he's pretty close to what he came there looking for. Okay, so right away we have um, Susan accidentally burning down Edie's house and leaving crucial evidence behind. And Mike is there for some suspicious reason. Next up, let's talk about Lynette Scavo. Here she is. Lynette Scavo is a stay-at-home mom of four, but before she was a mom, she worked in advertising and really worked her way up the corporate ladder, and then she had kids, and her husband thought it was best if she stayed home with the kids. Um, her husband is named Tom. Here he is. He is a good guy. He has a good heart. He's fun. Um... He works. He's also in advertising. Here's a picture of their kids. I didn't want to print individual pictures of each of the kids. That just felt weird. So they have um, three boys. Two of them are twins, Porter, Preston, and Parker. And then they have a baby girl, Penny. And yeah, that's the Scavo family. Lynette goes to the funeral reception without Tom because he's out of town on business. And she's really struggling to wrangle her three boys and the baby. At one point during the funeral reception, she has to sit down to nurse Penny. And the boys run outside and jump in Mary Alice Young's pool. Um, she is pretty upset because they're swimming in their clothes. But they point out, no, mom, we're in our bathing suits. Because they put on bathing suits under their clothes. Meaning they planned all of this. The boys are their nightmare. They're really sweet, though, especially um, Parker. Parker is my fucking favorite. I love Parker. He is the sweetest little bean. Anyways, Tom gets home from his business trip about halfway through the episode. He, like, pounces on Lynette. He gets the boys outside to toss their football around, and then they go upstairs to the bedroom. To illustrate where Lynette is in the pilot, they're about to do it. Lynette tells Tom that her doctor took her off the pill because of some swelling issues she was having, so he's going to have to put on a condom. Tom says, what's the big deal? Let's risk it. Lynette punches him in the face and is like, no. I'm like, I mean, good for her. Like, she set her boundaries. For most of season one, Lynette is mostly used for the C plots. So we have, like, the overall mystery, which I'll explain what it is at the end of the pilot. And then we have secondary mystery, which kind of ebbs and flows. But then we have the random happenings of Wisteria Lane in the greater community. And Lynette is central to most of those. So she has like single episode plot lines that don't go anywhere. And that's why they're not on the wall. But she is still a crucial character to the show. Next up, we have Gabrielle Solis. Here she is. Gabby used to be a model in New York City, but she moved to the suburbs with her husband, Carlos. And um, yeah, she loves rich men and rich food. Gabby is having an affair with her gardener, John. John is 17. She's unhappy in her marriage. She's lonely. She's just not fulfilled. And John fills in some of the gaps with the emotional need of Gabby. Um, there's so much that happens between Gabby and Carlos and John, so we will get to it when we get to it. Because of the affair, Gabby is obviously very scared of being caught, so one day when she and Carlos are heading out to a fancy dinner, he notices that the grass has not been cut, even though John was like just at their house. She's like, it looks fine to me. I don't know what you're talking about, Carlos. And then while he's at the dinner, she goes home in her fancy ass gown and mows the lawn and then goes back to the dinner so that when he gets home, he notices that the, the lawn was cut the whole time. Last but certainly not least, we have Brie Vandekamp. Brie is my favorite character on the entire series. Um, she has lots of ups and downs and moments where we hate her and moments where we love her. And we will talk about all of them together and I can't wait. Brie 
is the perfect wife and mother. She's everything you would want a housewife to be. She cooks, she cleans, she hosts parties. She is, she's perfect, but she's not perfect to her own family. They fucking hate this bitch. So this is her husband, Rex. He's a doctor, and then Andrew and Danielle are her kids. Now, in this episode, they're all pissy because Brie has made them a really fancy dinner, and all Danielle wants is pizza or French onion soup or something. And Brie is like, well, we can't have French onion soup because your father is allergic to onions. Anyways, Rex decides that maybe the family should go out to dinner, so they go to this kind of trashy place for dinner, um, the kids go to play arcade games, and then Rex tells Bree he wants a divorce. Bree does not handle this very well, but she's not very good at expressing emotions, especially negative ones. So she just takes his plate and goes off to the salad bar to make his dinner for him. That's when Martha Hilber walks on over to see what the hell is up. Because Brie would usually not be found dead in an establishment like this. So there's got to be a reason she's here. Like, what is she doing? How is she? Um, Brie certainly does not tell Martha Hoover that Rex has just told her he wants a divorce. That is a no-no now. But the conversation distracts her and she accidentally puts onions on his salad. So she gets back to the table and Rex takes a few bites of a salad and he starts choking and he can't breathe. And Brie obviously made a huge mistake, but it, it was a mistake. They end up at the hospital and after that, Brie cries in the bathroom. Um, she is failing as a wife and a mother. No one loves her. And she's trying so hard to make everything perfect, but no matter what she does, it's just not good enough. I don't know guys, she's kind of mother. She's kind of mother. <laughs> Finally, I want to talk about Mary Alice's family. So her husband is named Paul and she has a teenage son named Zach. During the funeral reception, when Lynette's kids jump into the pool, we see Paul staring at the bottom of the pool. And Mary Alice says that Paul isn't concerned with the happenings of the funeral or like the neighborhood. He's really more concerned about what's below the surface. So, you know, telling the What's under the pool? What's under the pool, man? What's under the pool? A little later that episode, Zach wakes up in the middle of the night and hears something peculiar coming from outside. So he goes over to his window and he takes a peek and there's Paul digging up at the bottom of the pool. In the aftermath of Mary Alice's funeral, the girls are reeling and they are so confused why Mary Alice would choose to end her own life if her life seemed so perfect. And of course, by this point in the pilot, we know that all of these suburban housewives seem perfect on the outside, except maybe Susan, who's kind of a flop. Um, but they're all doing their best and they're all suffering in some way. So it's kind of upsetting that this could happen to anyone in their friend group, really. Like, why was it Mary Alice? So they go and help Paul clean out some of Mary Alice's things, and this is when they stumble across a letter addressed to Mary Alice, and it was postmarked the day that she died, so they decide to open it up. The letter is on a piece of purple stationery, and it says, I know what you did. It makes me sick. I'm going to tell. Oh God, Mary Alice, what did you do? So one would reason that because she received this letter on the day that she killed herself, maybe this is the reason. And so the mystery is laid out before us. What did Mary Alice do? What did Mary Alice do? We'll find out this season on Desperate Housewives. So that wraps up the pilot, and I hope you feel like you know a little bit about each of the girls. Obviously, we will learn more about them as the season goes on. I will be going episode by episode. I have 75 pages of notes that I have condensed down into basically what each character does that's important to the overall story or absolutely essential to their character growth throughout this season. As I mentioned, Lynette isn't gonna have all that much to do in season one because she spends most of her time with plots that only last one episode. So I, uh, so listen, 75 pages is enough. This video is probably three hours. 
um, I wanted to focus on the good stuff. Also, I have begun the process of highlighting those who have died on the show. So I've just added this little, so it's just like a little tombstone to Mary Alice's photograph. Episode two. So it turns out the object that Paul dug up from underneath the pool was an old toy chest. It's this wooden toy chest. It has like little bears on it. It's cute. And he wraps it up in plastic and tape and then takes it to the lake and tosses it into the water. Susan and Mike agree to have dinner together, but Edie waddles her way in and gets herself an invitation. Throughout the whole dinner, Susan and Edie are both highlighting things about their past because they want to make each other look bad in front of Mike. Mike finds out that they are both divorcees. Susan is very jealous because Edie is hot and she assumes that Mike will want to go for Edie. Susan later finds out that Mike had a partner and she died um, and he's not over it. And so she decides that for now at least it's better if they stay friends. Marie Van de Kamp tells her husband Rex that they cannot just go ahead and divorce. They need to try couples counseling first. They go and see um, Dr. Goldfein and they start couples counseling. Gabby continues to struggle to hide her affair from Carlos. As for Edie, in the aftermath of her house burning down, she is staying with Mrs. Huber. And Mrs. Huber is also helping her clean up the remains of her old home. Um, trying to gather whatever she can salvage, clothes and jewelry and such. And among the objects, Mrs. Hooper finds Susan's glass measuring cup. She doesn't know it's Susan's, but Edie says, oh, that's not mine. She doesn't really think much of it. Later on, Mrs. Hooper is trying to get some gossip from Susan about Mike. And so she stops by her house. And that's when she sees that Susan purchased a new glass measuring cup. She comments on it and she's like, oh, this is a nice measuring cup. And Julie says, oh yeah, we lost our old one. So it becomes clear to Martha Hooper that Susan had something to do with the fire. We also find out that Mike has a map of Wisteria Lane, pictures of the residents, and all kinds of information about the residents. He is apparently some sort of either stalker or PI. Um, not really sure what's going on there, but... Yeah, the question of what is Mike doing on Wisteria Lane becomes an even bigger mystery. Now, in regards to the Mary Alice mystery, the girls have begun wondering if maybe they should tell Paul about the letter that they got. Um, they don't know how involved they want to get because Paul is just kind of a strange guy. Something's just off about him. He's a little creepy. So they decide for now they're not going to give him the letter, but they're going to think about it. And at the end of the episode, the trunk that... Paul threw into the lake, rises to the surface. In episode three, Zach is really starting to struggle with the loss of his mom. Um, Paul didn't even put an obituary for Mary Alice in the local newspaper, which really upsets Zach. And Zach also finds a shoebox in the garage that holds the gun that Mary Alice used. So things are just not, not great for him. For Bree, tensions continue to grow in marriage counseling. Rex tells Bree that he wants some private sessions with Dr. Goldfine to discuss something, and he won't tell Bree what it is, which upsets her. That week, on her calendar, she notices that there was a dinner party that Mary Alice scheduled that was supposed to take place that week, but of course, Mary Alice cannot host a said party, so Bree decides that she will host it instead. She invites Paul and Zach, but they turn down the invitation, although Zach does thank Bree for remembering his mother. At the dinner party, Rex reveals to everyone that him and Brie are in couples counseling. And this is not something that Brie really wants to be public knowledge whatsoever. She is very ashamed of this fact, so she decides to share information with everyone else um, to kind of get back at Rex. Needless to say, Rex is not very happy with this, so he leaves and he goes to stay at a hotel. Lynette does not have a ton to do in this episode, but there is this really cute scene between Lynette and Tom where they are dancing in the kitchen and the three boys are sitting on the stairs watching them. It's just really cute, so I wanted to throw that in. In terms of development with mystery and the clues this episode, a news report reveals that there are human remains inside the toy chest. We don't know who they are, just that there are remains.
Also, at Dr. Goldfine's office, Brie is trying to do some snooping to find um, tapes of Rex's private sessions with Dr. Goldfine. She gets distracted, though, when she sees a tape on the shelf labeled with Mary Alice's name. So she takes a tape and takes it home to take a little listen. And finally, Paul Young decides to put his house up for sale and states that he and Zach need to leave Wisteria Lane. Episode four, Paul gets the note from the women and he tells them that it appears Mary Alice wrote the note to herself because she was struggling with some mental health issues. But then we see Paul hire a PI to figure out who wrote this note to his wife. Now, on the Susan measuring cup, burning each house down thing, Martha Huber puts together that perhaps Susan burnt down Edie's house because she's jealous about Edie's relationship or potential relationship with Mike Delfino. She basically threatened Susan, saying that she knows all about the fire and that it was her fault. So Susan goes and wakes up Julie to tell her that she's being blackmailed because if there's anyone who is going to know what to do when you, a mother, are being blackmailed, it is definitely your 12-year-old daughter. Andrew, um, as a reminder, Bree's son, he's really having a hard time with his parents' separation, and he starts acting out at school and having all kinds of problems. He uses fake IDs with his friends to get into a strip club, and Bree marches down there and drags him out, um, and then she apologizes to him for not being fully transparent with him about the separation. But... God, Brie and Andrew are such a mess. And like, this is only the very beginning. Okay. So I just want to note that like seeds are being planted here, you know? And at this point, like, yeah, Brie hasn't been completely honest with her kids about what's going on between her and Rex. But I don't think Brie really knows because she just doesn't understand why Rex is so upset. What is he seeking therapy for? What's going on with with Rex? Like this is this is her her man. Lynette continues to struggle with the three boys, and she considers putting them on ADHD medication. And she does end up getting the medication, but they don't want to take it, so she doesn't make them, and she moves on from the idea. Gabby has a really close call in being caught this episode. There's a sock under her bed. Um, it's a, a men's sock, one of John's socks, and Carlos finds it. So Gabby has to quickly make up this lie that their housekeeper uses them to dust. She like runs downstairs with a bunch of dirty socks and puts them in the laundry cupboard um, so that when she brings Carlos downstairs to show him, there are socks there. So like she does a good job covering this. It's a really close save though. And Carlos is still a little suspicious. Um, so when there's an issue with their cable and the cable man is there way later than he was supposed to be there, Carlos becomes suspicious that maybe Gabby is sleeping with the cable guy. So he goes to the cable man's apartment and says to this, to this man, you think you can have sex with whoever you want? And he proceeds to beat the crap out of him. And then Carlos looks around the apartment and he realizes that this man is gay. Poor cable man asks Carlos, is this because I'm gay? And Carlos says, yes. We're on episode four and we have our first hate crime, baby. <sighs> That night, there is a police sketch on the news of the man who broke into the cable man's house and beat him up, and Gabby and Carlos are in the bath together, and they see the picture on TV, and Gabby realizes, like, Carlos went into that because she suspected him of being the man she was having an affair with, so the stakes have just gotten even higher. It's, it's bad for Gabby. Mystery-wise, from the Mary Alice therapy tape, the women discover that Mary Alice's real name is Angela. So, like, why did she change her name? Who is she? <laughs> we are chugging. Let's keep going. Episode 5. While Susan is taking care of a neighbor's cat, 
there is a break-in. Now, a screwdriver is left as evidence. Turns out Mike is missing a screwdriver from his toolbox. In this episode, we also see Mike meet up in person with Noah, who is the man that he is working for. Um, we don't know who he is searching for during this Wisteria Lane search, but like something weird is going on. This is also the episode where Susan and Mike finally have their first kiss. I'm sure suburban women everywhere cheered at this moment. Bree stops by the young house and Paul is at home, but Zach is there and she decides to invite Zach over for dinner. They end up talking a little bit and Zach tells her that Christmas is going to be really hard this year without his mom. And that's when Bree opens up to him about losing her own mother when she was young. It does give us a little bit of insight into why Bree is the way she is and why she's such a perfectionist. Because Brie has really opened up to him here, Zach feels safe telling Brie a little secret of his own, which is that he knows why his mother killed herself and that it was something that he did, something bad. On the night that Brie and Zach are supposed to have dinner together, Rex asks Brie to get dinner with him. And so Brie chooses her husband because it is a small chance to save their marriage, and discuss what's going on between the two of them. So while they are out, Zach breaks into the Van de Camp home. But Zach didn't commit a crime or do anything other than breaking into the house. He just put up all of Bree's Christmas decorations. Paul gets to the house and he is livid that Zach did this. And while Zach stands there while Paul's yelling at him, Bree reaches over and holds his hand, and it's really sweet. After that night, Paul leaves Wisteria Lane, and he tells everyone else that Zach has gone to stay with some relatives. Carlos is still suspicious that Gabby is having an affair. So his mom comes into town, Juanita Solis. Mama Solis, she's going to keep a close eye on Gabby for Carlos. She tells Gabby, one, that she should consider having children very soon. And two, she insinuates that she definitely knows about the affair and that she will get to the bottom of it. Mama Solis coming to town is really bad news for Gabby because usually Carlos is gone all day so she can have John over whenever she wants. But now Juanita is there all day long so she's going to have to start sneaking around. Episode 6. In Couples Counseling, Rex shares that he is not happy with his and Bree's sex life. Bree insists that although Rex doesn't think she's very present during sex, she loves sex. She, this bitch is like lying through her teeth. I don't know. I think she believes it though. Like she is just so delusional. I don't, I don't know that she knows she's not being honest. Like I think... Because she wants to be a perfect wife and mother so badly, she's convinced herself, no, I love sex, and I love sex with men. She goes to Rex's hotel in lingerie to seduce him, and they are about to do the deed when she notices on his nightstand there is a burrito dripping with cheese and beans, and it is so disgusting that she simply has to stop what they're doing. And Rex is very upset by this, so they end up not having sex that night. Finally, Rex tells Bree the big secret, the big thing he's been keeping from her, which is that he likes to be dominated. Speaking of domination, Lynette struggles with an alpha mom at the boys' new school. So Lynette is attending a meeting about the school play, and this bitch, this is her right here, Maisie Gibbons is in charge, okay? She is the best mom there is, but all the other moms fucking hate her guts. She has completely ruined a production of Little Red Riding Hood, which Lynette is upset about, so she speaks up about it, and Maisie tells her, since she's not contributing anything to the play, that she should not have a say. So Lynette decides that she will do costumes. However, costumes are a lot of work. She is barely sleeping, and she doesn't know how she's going to get all this work done. And on top of that, Tom is having business people over for dinner, so she has to cook for them and make sure the house is in order. Like, there's just so much 
going on for Lynette. So she starts taking her kids ADHD medication to try and help her through the day. Gabby finds out that Danielle, Danielle Vandekamp and John are friends and have been hanging out a lot. Now, Gabby asks Brie, like, aren't you worried about the two of them having sex? And Brie says, no, of course not. Danielle and John are both in the abstinence club at school. <laughs> Gabby sneaks around while Mama Solis is home, and Juanita Solis ends up following her to the women's weekly poker game. And she gets pretty distracted by the game, so Gabby is able to sneak out and meet up with John. That night, Gabby tells Carlos that Juanita really enjoyed the poker game and hanging out with all of the women. And that's when Carlos tells Gabby that his mom is actually a gambling addict and that she should not have played poker. So, Gabby takes this information. And the next day, she tells Juanita that she wants to take her out to lunch at this really great buffet. So she drives the two of them to a casino. And she drops Juanita off and is like, Oh, grab lunch. I'll, I'll be right there. Um, and then she goes and meets up with John. Carlos tells Juanita that Gabby was so understanding and kind when he told her about the gambling issue. And that means Juanita is able to put together that Gabby knew about her gambling addiction the whole time and still took her to a casino. And what kind of person does that unless they are trying to hide something? So... Juanita is even more determined to figure out who sh this mystery man she's having an affair with is. She tells Carlos it's not going to be somebody who she flirts with in public. It's going to be someone she's trying to avoid and seem really casual with. And that's when Juanita observes the way that Gabby interacts with John when he's doing the gardening work. And she realizes it's the two of them having the affair. Okay, in terms of the mystery this episode... According to Paul, Zach is staying with relatives, but Susan is a little suspicious about that. So she goes to talk to Paul about where Zach is. Just, you know, ask, ask a few prying questions. Um, Paul is having a yard sale and Susan takes a bowl, um, like a crystal bowl, and Paul wraps it in this yellow blanket for her so it doesn't break. It turns out Zach is in a mental health care facility, for lack of better phrase. And I say that because Paul has forbidden that the so-called health care providers give Zach any therapy. Like, he's only allowed to have medication and not therapy. It's fucked up. Susan follows Paul to the center one day and confirms that Zach is indeed a patient there. And then she makes Julie sneak in to talk to Zach about what's going on. The pair develop a close friendship and Zach reveals to Julie he's been having some memory from when he was a kid, including, quote, what happened to Dana. I know what you're thinking. Who the fuck is Dana? We're supposed to be confused, okay? Nowadays, we have so much spoon-fed to us because audiences are so impatient. But it's like, here's some more information. Surprise. Figure it out. Figure it out. And on Desperate Housewives, there is a solution to, I would say, 99% of all loose threads that are introduced in the series. There are there's a few things that kind of get left and we're left on rewatch thinking like, whatever happened with that? But for the most part, the show is really good at tying things together. So hang tight. Episode seven, let's start with update on Paul Young. So the PI has successfully identified the paper that was used to write the blackmail note. Um, he also notes that the postmark came from town, so it's very likely that whoever wrote it is someone Mary Alice already knows. Now coming at this from the conventions of a typical mystery. This is not surprising information to us as the audience. We would expect it to be someone Mary Alice knows in order to play by the rules of a mystery. And also that means it has to be someone that we also know. Um, we may not know why they did it, the full extent of their relationship with Mary Alice or how they knew her. Um, there's going to be some clues that we don't know yet to make our accusations about who we think it might have been. But generally, we are playing by 
mystery conventions here, which is so fun to me personally. I love it. Paul is selling his house and Edie is a real estate agent. So she's helping him with the sale and she has some stationery in her bag. So Paul notices that it's the purple stationery. At that point, the PI offers to kill Edie for $10,000. She does not seem like a lot of money to hire someone, right? I don't know what the going rate is, but like $10,000 does not seem like a whole lot of money for all the risk. Rex tells Bree that he's hired a divorce lawyer and that she will be receiving divorce papers very soon. Andrew begins having even more problems, especially at school. Rex and Bree finally tell the kids that they're divorcing and Rex gets them each a gift um, to help them cope with the separation. So he gets Andrew a car and for Danielle, he offers to pay for her summer modeling school in New York. Now, this modeling school is something that Gabby helped her apply to and get into because she wants Danielle gone for the summer so that she'll stay away from John. Andrew visits Rex at his hotel because he wants to move in with his dad, even though he lives at a hotel and they can like have a little bachelor pad together. But Rex clearly does not want this to happen, which pisses Andrew off even more. So he goes out with his friends again with their fake IDs to get completely obliterated because he does not want to be sober the next time he has to see his mother. Tom and Lynette have people over for dinner. There are people from Tom's work and Tom is talking with his peers about some issues they're having with their current advertising project. So Lynette chips in and starts offering suggestions to them because she also used to work in advertising and she was really damn good at it. This is the first taste we get of girl boss Lynette and it's really fun and she's clearly really passionate about what she's doing and also she's really good at it. She's so sharp and it's been several years since she has gotten to work but she still is right on top of things and knows exactly what she's doing. Um, so good for her. A woman arrives to see Mike we learn that her name is Kendra and she is the daughter of Noah. So she's come by to kind of help Mike with the progress on this assignment he's working on, which we still don't completely know what it is yet. Susan and Edie follow Mike and Kendra out for the night. They go to this bar and they ride a bowl. Um, it's this whole thing. The PI who Paul hired shows up to start flirting with Edie so we can make contact with her, uh, you know, because he plans to kill her. And Kendra warns Susan to stay away from Mike and maybe consider asking him why he moved to Wisteria Lane. Okay, one final note on the mystery and then we're going to go talk about Gabby in this episode. So, Susan now knows that Julie had that conversation with Zach and the name Dana came up. So Susan is filling in the women that someone named Dana is a part of this mystery now. And Susan realizes that that yellow blanket she got is embroidered with a name. And the name on it is Dana. So Dana apparently was a baby. Gabby is supposed to go with Carlos and Juanita to the super fancy business dinner. But she plays sick so she can stay home and have John over. But Juanita is no dumb bitch okay so she takes a cab home so that she can catch gabby in the act so she has a little disposable camera on her and she goes upstairs and bursts into the bedroom and takes a picture of john and gabby doing it on the bed um gabby immediately realizes that like she's completely fucked because if carlos is willing to beat up a cable man like, things are just going to be bad for her. It's, it's, it's Jover. She runs. She fucking runs with that proof, right? She runs right out into the street. And it's at that moment that a car comes around the corner and hits Juanita and continues driving off. Gabby goes outside and takes the disposable camera from her because... She'll be damned if that evidence is going to get to Carlos. Meanwhile, Bree immediately hears what happened on the street, and she hurries inside to call for help, and Andrew is there crying in the kitchen. And Bree's in a panic, but then Andrew is, is clearly very upset, and he's like, Mama, 
And that's when Brie realizes that it was Andrew who hit Juanita with the car because he was driving home drunk. So Brie picks up the phone. She calls Rex and says, we need you to come home. Episode eight. And I want to start by saying that this episode was advertised as being the first to have the death of a main character in it, aside, of course, from Mary Alice Young. So the PI tells Paul that he's ready to move forward with Edie and asks him if he's sure. Paul says yes. He has paid the man, so Edie is going to be taken out. While Susan is trying to get a dog treat for Mike's dog, um, she's in his cupboards, right? And she accidentally stumbles across piles and piles of cash and a gun. Later in the week, when she has a spare key, uh, she's supposed to let in a repair person, she decides to do a little snooping. Not only does she snoop, though, she takes the cash out of the cupboard and lays it all over the place so she can count it. And she's distracted when there's a knock on the door and it's the repairman he's just trying to leave a receipt now instead of susan meyer using her brain for once in her life she picks up all the cash takes it upstairs into the bathroom and drops it into the sink mind you the repairman has already left all he had to do was like drop off a receipt and so he just ended up like taping it to the door but susan just had to make everything a problem as she's walking away from the sink the floor beneath her collapses. She falls through and she's left dangling like this with her legs through the floor. And she is stuck there until Mike comes home and finds her and sees that she had rummaged through all his stuff, including his cash and the gun. Needless to say, the little weekend romantic trip that they had planned where they were supposed to consummate the relationship is off. He tells her to get out of his house it's like, it's so bad for Susan right now, okay? It's bad for Susan, it's bad for Gabby, it's bad for Brie, it, like, we've hit rock bottom. And we're only on episode eight, and someone dies in this episode, so. Mike technically ends the relationship, but they don't really stay broken up for very long, so take that with a grain of salt. Following the hit and run, Brie, one, gets rid of the car with Rex. They just take it to a part of town and leave the keys in the ignition and wait for someone to steal it. So the car is taken care of. Second, she is really concerned because Andrew really doesn't seem to be feeling all that guilty about what happened. Now, Brie is racked with guilt. And as Mary Alice says in a voiceover, Brie has spent most of her life feeling guilty because she's gay. She wants Andrew to start therapy. Andrew is not interested in that. Bree points out that Juanita could have died. And he's like, oh, she died? Oh. Oh. Okay. And Bree tells him that what she's worried about is that he doesn't have a soul. It's really sad, honestly. Like, they've already been struggling with their relationship for several episodes now just because of the separation. But now there's a hit and run on top of it. Like, they cannot get a break. In the Scavo household, Tom is away for a little longer than he was supposed to be because of work complications. And Lynette hits a breaking point. She is just exhausted and nothing is going right. She's addicted to her kids' ADHD medication. As she sits there in her kitchen crying, an image of Mary Alice appears in the window and offers Lynette her hand. It's so fucking beautiful. Now, if I were watching this in 2004 and I saw Mary Alice offer her hand, I would be shitting myself because I already know that someone dies in this episode, but I don't know who. So it could very well be Lynette, right? Like, going into the episode, you're like, oh, well, obviously it's going to be Mama Solis, right? Because she just got hit by a car. But now you're like, oh my god, it could be Lynette. But also, it could be Edie because Paul has hired someone to kill her. Um, maybe it's even Susan because she found out about Mike's money and the gun. Like, we don't know what kind of stuff he's up to. It's just bad. So Juanita Solis was not killed in the accident, but she is in a coma. Bree visits Gabby and Carlos to see how they're doing with everything. And Carlos decides to tell Bree that he and Gabby are starting a family very soon. And this is... Fucking news to Gabby, who has 
no interest whatsoever in having kids. And then Gabby finds out that John went to confession with his priest and told him about the affair and told him everything because he was feeling so guilty that what happened to Anita might be his fault. Like if he had never been having the affair with Gabby, then she would have had nothing to catch them for and therefore never would have run across the street and gotten hit by a car. Edie and Mrs. Huber have a little bit of a fight um, and Mrs. Huber says she's going to go visit her sister and when she gets back, she wants Edie to be gone. That day, Edie goes and meets with the PI who has been hired to kill her, but she thinks it's a meeting with a real estate developer. While she is taking notes on their meeting in this sort of remote location, he notices that she is taking a few notes on the same purple stationery that was used in the blackmail letter. And he comments on it. He says, that's nice stationery. And Edie says, thanks, it's stolen. So he's like, what do you mean? And she's like, oh, well, my house burned down. So I've been taking things from Martha Hoover all the time. So that means it was not Edie who wrote the blackmail letter, right? was fucking Martha Huber. The PI reports this to Paul and he offers to kill Mrs. Huber instead of Edie, but Paul says that he wants to talk to Mrs. Huber first. So no, don't worry about killing anyone. Just keep the money and leave. Mike and Susan are back together and they are making out. Um, I'm sure that there are people who watch the show who cheered when this happened and they were like, this is the best day of my life. This is my ship. I love Susan and Mike. I love Susan. Good for her. And to those people, I say congratulations. And I truly wish them well. And I'm really happy that they were able to follow a love story like this. I, however, do not experience much joy. So, um, I don't give a fuck about this plot line. But what I do love about this scene as well, they are, you know, things are heating up. It cuts to Paul at Martha Hoover's house, and they are having a verbal confrontation. Martha reveals to Paul that, yes, she did write the letter because she knows about what they did to that baby. As the audience, we can assume the baby was Dana. At that point, it cuts back to Mike and Susan making out, and then it cuts back to Paul and Martha. Paul is beginning to escalate things physically with Martha. So it's like physical violence contrasted with physical pleasure. It's beautiful. I love this scene. Every time I rewatch season one, I'm just so like, even though I don't care about this, I'm so excited by the scene. Paul grabs Martha Huber's blender, which remember used to belong to Mary Alice and hits her on the head with it and then strangles her to death. And now we get this moment. And just like that, a second woman on Wisteria Lane has died. That's the end of episode eight. This video took about a hundred hours to make. So if you're enjoying it so far, I would love if you consider hitting the subscribe button down below. That way you can make sure you catch part two when it's out. If you have a few dollars to spare and want to support me and the channel, I am going to leave my buy me a coffee link uh, down below. I will add your name to the credits as a, as a producer credits for part two. Any and all funds is literally just going to go to buying more tape and printing more pictures for the wall. So this is my tape that I bought. You can see I'm almost out of orange. And I got to tell you, the girlies do not stop committing acts of violence against each other after season three. So like, I need more orange tape. Let's jump in episode nine. Let's start out with Paul Young. He buries Mrs. Hoover in the woods and then he gets a call that Zach has escaped from the mental health facility. Julie has actually broken Zach out and she is hiding him in the Meyer house. She wants to get a little more information from Zach about what's going on and who Dana is and what happened with Mary Alice. He tells Julie that he has recently been having memories from when he was a child. He thinks he was probably around four years old and he remembers there being blood and he remembers his parents telling him that what happened wasn't his fault. And he tells Danielle 
that he killed his baby sister, Dana, and his parents buried her body to help protect him. The nurses find letters between Zach and Julie, and they let Paul know, and Paul goes over to the Meyer house and demands to know where Zach is. Julie insists that she doesn't know, and Susan tells Paul that her daughter would never lie and that he needs to leave them alone. Bree and Rex argue at a swim meet about the proper way to punish Andrew. They talk about maybe sending him to some sort of troubled teen rehabilitation camp, and then Bree goes into Andrew's room and discovers that he's been smoking pot. She then finds his stash and plants it in his locker at swim so that he can call the coach and report that there was weed in someone's locker and therefore get Andrew in trouble. Now, he's very upset because he has swim scholarships and things he's really counting on, but he hit someone with a car and doesn't seem to give a fuck. So Bree is just doing everything she possibly can to try and get Andrew some sort of help. And Rex is not helping. He's not taking it seriously either. He's more concerned about their separation um, and like wanting to no longer be a part of their lives. So it just sucks for everyone in that household. The big plot of this episode kicks off when Gabby is chatting with one of Mama Solis's nurses at the hospital. And she talks to her about why she's a nurse. Um, and the nurse tells her that it's really fulfilling, although it's really difficult at the moment because they're understaffed and they don't have any extra money to pay the nurses more. So Gabby decides to host a fashion show to raise money. I love this. We love a philanthropist. Like, yes, she's having an affair with an underage boy. Yes, she's kind of happy that her mother-in-law is in a coma, but she's doing charity. So... Now, during preparation for the fashion show, John and Gabby are sitting together, and Gabby has her foot, like, all over his crotch under the table. Susan drops something on the floor because she's clumsy and silly. She bends down to pick it up, and she sees what's going on under the table. She confronts Gabby about it the next day and tells her it's wrong to sleep with John because he's only 17. Finally, a Susan W. Like, we've been waiting for this moment in Finally, Susan is the one with common sense. We love to see it. She actually calls Gabby out for this. Now, we do have a little snag. John's mom, Helen, is in the fashion show. Now, during the week, she overhears John and some teenage boys talking about who John is sleeping with. And he tells the friends that he's sleeping with a MILF. Susan talks to John about what's been going on between him and Gabby, and because Helen sees the two of them talking, she assumes that Susan is the one having an affair with her son. So she sabotages Susan during the fashion show. Um, Susan has to like walk out on stage in a completely torn dress. But yeah, Gabby does end up coming clean to Mrs. Rowland and tells her that she's been the one having the affair. Helen is not pleased, obviously, and says that the situation is far from over. That night, the FBI arrive at the Solis house, and we expect them to arrest Gabby, right? Because of what she did. She gets down on her knees and starts to confess to Carlos what happened and say that she is so, so sorry. She doesn't get to mention the affair yet because the FBI bursts in and Carlos gets arrested. On the mystery side of things, the detectives have identified the type of toy chest that they found in the lake. They have found the person who built them, and they go to his workshop to question him. Um, he says it will just take a little while to pull out the receipts, but he keeps them all so he can help them figure it out. And it turns out that the remains in the chest were not that of a baby, but of an adult. An adult female was killed and put in the chest. The carpenter asked how they fit a body in there, and the detective tells him that the body was cut into pieces first. Episode 10. Julia's still hiding Zach away. She's, like, bringing food upstairs to him. It's very dramatic, really. Now, Susan is just waiting to sleep with Mike again, and she decides to have him over during the day. Um, but the thing is, Zach is in the house, right? Zach is creeping around upstairs. Really, he's just trying to find a place to hide. But Susan is like, 
Mike, is that you? And of course, Zach doesn't answer because he's not Mike. So <laughs> Zach finds a temporary place to hide. And then when Mike comes upstairs, whacks him with a thigh master. Eventually, they do indeed discover Zach is there. And it's a whole thing. Um, Paul drags him back home. But first, Mike gives Zach his phone number and says that if he ever needs anything that he can call and Mike will have his back. Which is really nice because he's going home with Paul who is a complete asshole and creepy and it seems has torn a woman to pieces to put her body into a toy chest and then bury her. Susan is very upset with Julie for hiding a fugitive in the house, and Julie points out that ever since the divorce, it has been her who has been the parent around here. Good for her. Julie deserves some respect on her name, okay? Like, she is so right. I'm so glad she called Susan out on this. Like, yes, Susan had a W last episode for calling out Gabby, and now it's Julie's turn. Give her the crown. Okay, let's talk about Brie. So, in this episode, we learned that Maisie Gibbons is a professional dominatrix, and Rex is one of her clients. Brie begins suspecting Rex of having an affair when she smells perfume on his coat, and then she has this amazing line that's like, Andrew, Danielle, daddy's going to fornicate for us. Rex meets up with Maisie again, and this time he has a heart attack. Brie goes to the hospital and finds out that it was Maisie Gibbons who signed Rex into the hospital. Um, the nurse is also kind of confused because she assumed that Maisie Gibbons was his wife since they were having sex when he had a heart attack. So Brie is furious, but she tells Rex that she's very glad he didn't die because she is going to ruin his life. Gabby goes to visit Carlos. He is behind bars because his business partner fled the country after their work was found to be importing products made via enslaved laborers. So they won't let him out on bail until he hands over his passport so that he won't also flee the country. This is when the Solises start losing all of their wealth. So Gabby gets her car towed. She doesn't want to lose all of her possessions though, so she brings all of her things over to Breeze and hides it all in her garage. It's pretty fun. Um, and really, she misses Carlos. Like, this is the first time we really get to see how much Gabby truly loves him. It's kind of sweet. Although everything's kind of messy between them, but it's sweet. Meanwhile, Edie is starting to wonder about where her friend Martha Hoover went. And Edie does not like worrying because it gives her wrinkles. Episode 11, Martha Hoover's sister, Felicia. Here she is, Miss Felicia Tillman. She comes into town to look for her sister, and she is so delightfully weird. I'm obsessed with Felicia Tillman. She is one of my favorite supporting characters in the whole series. The most important thing here is that Felicia is pretty sure that Martha Hoover is dead. Susan has kind of a fun plot this episode. So it's Julie's birthday, and she invites Carl to this birthday party. Um, she's going to be having Mike as her date, but she says Carl can bring a date if he wants. Carl has recently broken up with Brandy, who was the secretary he cheated on Susan with, but now he needs a new date. So he takes Edie. At the birthday karaoke dinner, Edie is drunk and she tells Susan that she and Carl kissed once at a Christmas party. They were under the mistletoe and they kissed. This is the first time Susan knows that Carl ever did anything with anyone other than the one secretary. So now she's finding out it was not a one-time thing like Carl always said it was, but it was much worse. And Edie was involved. Susan gets up and does the most iconic performance of New York, New York of all time. And she starts yelling at Carl during it. And um, I quote it all the time. I think it's phenomenal performance. Love it. After the dinner... Carl shows up at Susan's and apologizes for what happened, and he also confesses that he wants her back. Susan is so excited to hear this, but not because she still has feelings for Carl or because she wants him back. It's because now she knows that she doesn't feel anything for him at all. She doesn't want him back, and in fact, she loves Mike. So she runs across the street and kisses Mike. 
Bree does not want to tell the kids that Rex was unfaithful yet. So as far as they're concerned, it's just the normal separation that's been happening. But the kids are pretty upset because Rex had a heart attack. And yes, Bree is taking care of him. He's moved back home so Bree can care for him. But she's not really being as doting as perhaps she could be. In this episode, we meet a new character named George Williams. Here is George. We meet him in this episode. He is a pharmacist. And when Bree and Rex are at the pharmacy to get some of Rex's medications, Bree decides to ask him out to dinner. And it's supposed to make Rex jealous. So anyways, they go out on a date, and then Andrew finds the two of them in the car when they get home from the date and finds out that um, Rex cheated on Bree, and Andrew's very upset by this. So for once, Bree and Andrew are seeing eye to eye. It's a beautiful moment. I wish it lasts longer. <laughs> Gabby is broke. She's struggling. She takes on a modeling job at the local mall. It's just nothing like the glamorous life she had in New York. And she's absolutely desperate to get Carlos and his money back. So she turns in the passport and gets him out on bail. But he's put on house arrest. So, Okay, for the mystery in this episode, the police discover Martha Hoover's car near the woods and start conducting a search for the body. The whole neighborhood gets in on this to help look for Martha. Now, since the police are indeed looking for a body, Paul decides to return to Martha's gravesite remove her jewelry, and plant it in Mike's garage. And then an ordinary citizen is walking their dog at the park, and the dog finds Martha Hoover's body. Episode 12. Bree goes on another date with George. He buys her an antique gun as a little gift, and then she takes him out shooting to, you know, teach him how to use a gun he's never used before. He tries to kiss her, and she freaks out and accidentally shoots him in the foot. Bree does not think it's a good idea for them to keep seeing each other. She is still married, and she likes George, but she's really just trying to make Rex unhappy, so she's not all that invested. Um, as long as Rex thinks that she's going out with George, she's doing enough, you know? George is not very pleased about this. And at the end of the episode, we see George sitting down with his TV dinner and turning on the VCR. It is a security tape from the pharmacy, and he is watching Bree visiting the pharmacy. Carlos is out of prison now, but in my opinion, he should be locked right up again because in this episode, he begins tampering with Gabby's birth control. But as you can see on the wall, I have lots of different colors of tape. And I would like to tell you now that the orange tape is for violent acts, bodily harm, assault, arson, etc. And um, they have one here because what the fuck? What the fuck, Carlos? What the fuck? God. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, Martha Hoover's body was found. It is Edie who gets the call that they found the body. Um, Martha Hoover is cremated, and Edie invites all the women to go on a trip with her to scatter Martha's ashes. No one goes except for Susan. And on this little trip, Edie is talking about what a great friend Martha was to her and how really she is the only friend that she has on Wisteria Lane. And Susan starts feeling really guilty, so she confesses to Edie that she burned her house down. First, Edie throws Martha's ashes in Susan's face. Later, they come to an agreement that Edie will not go to the police with this because one, I don't think she really wants to make any enemies on Wisteria Lane. People already hate her. And two, because it would just create this whole need for an investigation and slow things down and make it take longer for her to get her insurance money and therefore rebuild her house. And she wants her house back, so she doesn't tell on Susan. But she does make Susan agree that from now on, she will be invited to the women's weekly poker games. And finally, a few things from Mike. Mike gets home and sees that his house has been broken into. Um, all the money is gone. The gun is gone. All the info he had on the neighborhood is gone. And there's a voicemail from Noah saying that he took it all back because Mike is not working fast enough. Mike visits Noah in person and tells him that he's working as fast as he can, but these things take time. And Noah tells him that he does not have time to waste because he has cancer and he's dying and he needs to know what happened to his daughter before that. So his daughter 
would be Kendra's sister. Kendra is the friend who visited Mike in episode, like, seven. Noah also mentions that Mike has already killed for this woman once before. So this confirms Mike killed someone at some point. We don't know who, we don't know why, but Mike is a murderer, allegedly. Episode 13. Julie and Zach Young attend a school dance together. They are slow dancing. It's kind of cute. Um, Paul and Susan are chaperones of the event. During the evening, Zach tells Paul that he has memories from what happened the night that Dana was killed. He also tells him that he told Julie all about it. So at this point, since Paul knows that Susan already knows way too much, he decides to give her more information. So Paul tells Susan that, yes, Zach killed Dana, and they don't know exactly what happened, but by the time he and Mary Alice got to the crib, it was too late. And at this point, viewers are thinking, okay, how do you not know what happened if there was a ton of blood, according to Zach's memory? You would think you would be able to kind of figure it out, right? And also, why is there a grown-ass woman in a chest? And where's the baby? After the dance, Paul tells Zach that he is remembering everything wrong. He did not kill anyone, and Dana is very much still alive. In the Vandekamp household, Bree is continuing to give Rex his medication every day. Um, she really still wants to hurt Rex, so she's willing to take things a little further with George. She's out at a diner, and he randomly shows up, almost as if he's been following her around town. They have coffee, and the whole time, George is, like, clutching his thigh under the table. It's so gross. It's just, like, really bad vibes. Rex visits George at the pharmacy to get a refill of his prescription, and Rex tells George that Bree has only seen him to make him jealous. So George is upset, and once Rex walks away, we see George pour out the prescription bottle meant for Rex walks into the shelves with it, suggesting that he may be wanting to tamper with the medication. Lynette has a little moment this episode. So Tom's father is in town, and it turns out Tom is having an affair. And he has this woman over at the Scavo house, and Lynette is not very happy about this. So Lynette throws him out. She makes him go sit on the curb with his stuff, and when Tom gets home from work, he goes inside and talks to Lynette. And she is so nervous to tell him about the affair because she imagines it's going to completely devastate him. But Tom already knows. So Lynette is pissed because it's not appropriate to have his father there if he's going to be bringing women over. There are four young children in the house and also she just does not condone cheating. Tom basically says, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell my father what to do. And she throws Tom out too and then they're both sitting on the curb. It's pretty silly. Lynette tells Tom while they're laying in bed that night that if he would ever cheat on her, she would take the kids and leave him so fast. And then that night, Tom cannot sleep. He gets up and goes and sits at the kitchen table, and he tells his father, Dad, there's something Lynette doesn't know. I know some suburban moms... We're all about Susan and Mike. Personally, it's Tom and Lynette for me, okay? These are my parents. They raised me. This is mother. But these are my parents. We get even more Gabby and John this episode. John proposes to Gabby, and Gabby panics, so she accepts the ring. But then John's parents find out about it, and Gabby promises that she will return the ring, and she has no intention of marrying John. Episode 14, we are cruising. Felicia brings flowers to Paul that were delivered to her by mistake. And Paul explains that he had a standing order with the florist so that he would never forget flowers for his wife. Felicia sees a picture of Mary Alice on Paul's fridge and says, Good Lord, that's Angela. Uh-oh, someone knows her secret identity. Susan gives Mike a Valentine's Day card, and you remember how I said that she illustrates children's books? So, like, she's an artist, right? She gives him the shittiest Valentine's Day card I've ever seen in my life. It is so ugly. It makes me giggle every time. Um, it also just tells us a lot about Susan as a character, in my opinion. Like, 
I just kind of like the idea that she's not very good at her job. <laughs> she's just a flop in all departments. The Scavo boys are hanging around and they like throw a ball into Mike's yard and they all run over to get it. He mentions that he loves kids and he can't wait to have his own someday. And then he's carrying them piggyback and one of the boys looks right into the camera. It's so delightful. I like rewinded it three times because it just kept me laughing. Okay, do you remember the revelation that Rex likes to be dominated in the bedroom? Well, Brie agrees that she is willing to try a few things. And one of the first things they do <laughs> is discuss um, a safe word. Uh, Brie suggests perhaps Philadelphia. Um, but Philadelphia is not a very serious word. So Brie suggests, mm, how about Palestine? In this episode, we finally meet Mrs. McCluskey. Here is Mrs. McCluskey. She is kind of enemies with Lynette um, in this first episode. So the Scavo boys have stolen a clock from Mrs. McCluskey. They have a habit of going around and just like stealing things from neighbors' porches and from their yards. And one of their things is apparently Mrs. McCluskey's clock. Lynette asked the boys at one point, do you know what psychological warfare means? <laughs> it's pretty silly. Lynette makes the boys apologize, um, and Mrs. McCluskey has them in for, you know, a little cookie. At one point while they're chatting with Mrs. McCluskey, she tells them that she's not very happy that they stole her clock, but it is really nice that they wanted to do something nice for their mom. Mary Alice's voiceover at the end of the Mrs. McCluskey Lynette frenemy arc is that the two women never realized that love was the one thing they had in common. It's so sweet. Um, yeah, it's a great, this is just a lovely introduction to Mrs. McCluskey because we get to see so many sides of her in a single episode. Like, yeah, she's the cranky neighbor lady next door, but also she has a heart of gold. Mike is continuing to search for answers for Noah, but he's looking in all the wrong places. At one point, he breaks into another house and the homeowner shoots him. Um, he gets shot in the abdomen and he runs away. He goes to some friends of Noah to stitch him up, but he still has his Valentine's Day dinner with Susan planned. So he has to go to the dinner with these stitches. When they get to the restaurant, Susan trips and Mike catches her, but that causes his stitches to tear. So during the dinner, he just like starts bleeding out. Um, and Susan is trying to have a serious conversation with him about where their relationship is going and the fact that she doesn't really want more kids, but she's open to it, but like doesn't really want more, but you know, it's Mike and Susan just like goes on and on and Mike is sitting there bleeding. So eventually he passes out and Susan rushes into the hospital and she overhears a nurse saying that it is a gunshot wound. Episode 15. So Susan finds out about the bracelet through Lynette and she is stuck wondering whether or not she should tell the cops because it is evidence that maybe Mike killed Martha Hoover, but she still doesn't know if it's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, Zach invites Julie to his birthday party. She's not really sure if she wants to come and more likely her mom is not going to let her be around Zach much because the whole breaking him out thing and then they ended their weird little relationship because he was getting kind of possessive. Susan decides she is not going to let Julie go to the birthday party. But then the cops stop by Susan's house and they want to ask her some questions about Mike. So she goes to the station. While Susan is answering questions at the station, Julie sneaks out to Zach's party. Now at the station, Susan gets some upsetting information. The cops first ask her where Mike was the night that Martha Hooper died and Susan shares that they were together and that was the night that the two of them first consummated their relationship and that it was a memorable night and yeah, the next morning she made little pancakes in the shape of hearts and you can ask Julie about that. Um, so Susan, she is completely head over heels for this guy and she trusts him completely. And then the cop decides to get a little more insight about how much he really knows about Mike. So he passes over Mike's folder and it reveals that Mike was previously convicted for drug trafficking and for manslaughter and he served time in prison. Now Susan is so sure that Mike wouldn't kill anyone but as soon as she is passed over his record by the cops, 
she kind of falls apart and she has no choice but to believe this is the facts and that Mike was lying. And based on her reaction, the cops and the detective decide that Susan has no part in this Martha Hoover situation. Even if Mike did kill her, they don't really think she's lying. Um, they, they trust Susan's judgment because she is so stunned by what she sees in this FBI report. Susan is livid that Mike lied to her. So when she goes home, the first thing she does is call out to Julie. And she's like, Julie, mama needs a hug. Girl, it is not your 12-year-old daughter. 13, she had her birthday. It is not your 13-year-old daughter's job to give you a hug when you find out that your man committed manslaughter. I'm sorry. I can't with Susan. It's so funny. Just the first thing she comes, and she's like, Julie, like, oh, girl, go find, go find a friend. Go find one of your real friends. Go to Edie, okay? Like, there's other options. Let Julie rest. Anyways, Julie is at the pool party, obviously, at Zach's. And there's one point where people are making fun of Zach because he's a little strange. And he, like, pretends to fire a gun at them. Um, it's really disturbing. And Julie is upset by this, and I do not blame her. I would also want to get out of that situation as soon as possible. And she tells Zach that's not funny, and he's like, come on, Julie, I didn't mean anything by it. And so Julie storms off with Danielle, and they leave the party. Then Susan comes to the party to start looking for Julie, and she sees two people making out in the pool, so she assumes that it must be Julie and Zach. So she walks around the pool, and she finds discarded swim trunks on the side of the pool which means that julie and zach are in there naked together and she's not very pleased by this so she starts yelling and she just waits for them to come up from underwater it is not zach and julie who is it i will tell you later on in this episode summary there is some family drama in brie's house as per usual it's a lovely morning until brie finds a condom in the laundry basket it is a wrapped unused condom Rex insists that it is not his. Brie is like, well, if it's not yours, who is it? And Rex reminds her that there is more than one man living in the house. Brie is very upset at the possibility of Andrew having sex at his age, but Rex reminds her that they can't stop him from doing it, so they might as well make sure he's being safe. So reluctantly, Brie puts the condom on top of Andrew's folded clothes when she puts the laundry in his room. And good for Brie. You know, she, she had a moment there, but she came around. And then at dinner, Andrew tells his parents about the condom and how he thought it was weird that it was there. And he explains that it is not his. And then he looks over at Danielle. Later, Danielle tells Brie that she plans to sleep with John, but it hasn't happened yet. Brie asks why Danielle wants to do that. And she explains that John isn't interested in her anymore because they haven't sealed the deal yet. And Brie really tries to stress to her that she doesn't have to sleep with someone just to make them stay and that this is a shitty guy if he is going to dump her because of that when they are 16. And then Danielle says, look, mom, I love you a lot, but you're the last person who should ever give advice about sex and happiness. Brie goes to John's apartment to talk to him about the whole Danielle thing. And he tells Brie that he doesn't actually feel that way about Danielle. He has no plans to sleep with her. It was just an excuse because he's not really all that interested in her anymore. And Brie encourages him to be very brutal when he dumps her. So that's why Danielle is so upset at the party. Lynette has a little drama this episode. Yay. So Tom is upset because somebody else got chosen for a promotion at work. But then they go to a company softball game and the guy who was given the promotion collapses and has a heart attack. So then Tom is offered the position. Tom tells Lynette he did get the promotion, but it means he's going to have to do even more traveling. And Lynette is not very pleased by this because Tom is already barely home and she's trying to raise four kids. And it is not working out for her. As we saw in episode eight, when she like had a nervous breakdown, it is, it's just not working. So during a busy work day, Lynette takes the boys to visit Tom at the office and she gets a chance to talk to one of his bosses, and she kind of guilts her into not letting Tom have that promotion after all because it will mean more time away from the family. 
In this episode for Gabby, John's roommate, Justin, shows up and he offers to do lawn work for Gabby. And he also suggests that Gabby do some of the things for him that she did with John. And he threatens her and says that if he doesn't do those things, then Mr. Solis might have to find out about Gabby and John. So Gabby goes over to Justin's apartment later. And again, he shares an apartment with John, but John's not home at the moment. And Justin confesses that he really doesn't have any intention of like blackmailing her. It's nothing like that. It's just that he needs to sleep with Gabby because he thinks he might be gay. And if he can just sleep with Gabby, then he would know for sure. So Gabby kisses Justin and he feels nothing at all. And Gabby is like, yep, you're gay. And that's that. Carlos and Gabby are continuing to struggle with their financial situation. And Carlos says that they might have to sell their house. Gabby is upset, but okay with that. And Carlos is more humiliated than anything about having to give up something that is such a symbol of status for them. But it becomes clear in this episode how much Gabby really does love Carlos. She's willing to give up so much to make their marriage work. Um, even though there was, you know, the whole John, Gabby thing. Um, there's layers, okay? Gabby is, is a complicated woman. Mike meets Noah for dinner again, and we finally learn that the woman he is looking for is named Deirdre. And also, Noah warns Mike that because he is being framed for murder, that must mean that he is getting really close to finding out who did this. And then I have in my notes, Noah hires someone else for something. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure we like see him interviewing these like tough guys. It's not really clear what's going on yet, though, but we'll see if I have something about that in the next episode's notes. Finally, to wrap up this birthday party arc, who was it that Susan sees in the pool? Well, it is Andrew Vandekamp and Justin, and they are lovers, and they are gay. And Susan is stunned. She, like, stumbles backwards, and Andrew asks her not to tell anyone about it and susan is like no of course and yeah i this is one moment where like we trust susan she's not gonna out andrew it's none of her business who was making out in that pool as long as it was not her daughter and zach it's not her business and while susan always has her nose in other people's business she's not as bad as martha huber was martha huber may she rest in peace so we can trust Susan to keep this on the down low. But yeah, this is when it's revealed to the audience that Andrew is gay. Episode 16. So in this episode, Paul decides he's not going to sell the house because Zach is struggling enough as it is, so he doesn't want to make his life any more complicated. Felicia is on a walk. She sees Paul, and they chat a little bit, and Paul decides to ask her about the murder investigation. Felicia Tillman states that she is absolutely certain that Mike had nothing to do with the murder. And then she mentions again that Salt Lake City is so nice this time of year. Once again, hitting on the head that she knows Paul and Mary Alice or Angela from wherever they lived before, presumably now Salt Lake City. Paul then is going through some of Mary Alice's things and he finds a home video that shows Mary Alice winning an award. And first of all, her name is indeed Angela in this, but second, Felicia Tillman is on the tape as one of her fellow nurses. In this episode, Maisie gets arrested for solicitation. It's the gossip at the country club. Huge deal because everyone knew Maisie Gibbons. She used to be a member at the club until her husband lost his job and they had to give up their membership. Now it's the talk of everyone. And rumor has it that this list is going to come out as part of a plea deal that she's doing. Rex and Brie are at the country club having lunch when the news starts to be spread around. And for Brie, this is the first time that she knows Rex wasn't just having an affair. He was paying Maisie for services. So it makes everything worse for her because according to the gossip, the client list is going to come out. So not only will the whole public know that Rex is having an affair with a woman, everyone's going to know that he was one of Maisie's clients. Brie visits Maisie in prison and she offers her a bunch of money in order to take Rex's name off the list or to not release the list at all, but Maisie refuses and she says that 
Brie and everyone at the club has never been kind to her or offered to help when her husband lost her job. So she sees no reason to accept help now, especially when the help is really just to benefit Brie. So the client list ends up coming out, which is completely humiliating for Brie. Gabby and Carlos, struggling financially, have started having sewer and plumbing issues. They get a quote from Mike, and Mike is a little surprised that they called him because he was taken in for questioning about the murder of Martha Hoover, and so everyone on the street just assumes he did it. But Carlos says that he's not afraid of that, and everyone deserves a second chance, and he still has his ankle monitor on, so there's some like solidarity there that he doesn't hate Mike for all of this, and he trust him still. Um, Mike offers to do the job at cost, but they still can't afford that. So they have to do their laundry out in the hot tub and they can't really take showers. It's a whole disaster. Um, at one point, Gabby steals a porta potty from a construction site, which is pretty funny. And the neighbors are starting to wonder what's going on because they're doing their laundry in the hot tub and they smell really bad and they keep finding excuses to use other people's bathrooms. Um, so Brie asks Gabby if she and Carlos are having financial problems and she offers the money to her. Um, this is the same money she had in savings that she was prepared to give Maisie Gibbons, but Gabby insists she doesn't want it. And then at the end of the episode, Brie tells her that she will not take no for an answer because she wants to help her friend. Edie is back, baby. We're so excited to see her in this episode. Um, so she goes to check on Susan, which... Can we appreciate that? So Susan obviously is still really upset because Mike lied to her and turns out Mike killed someone. Um, and Edie goes to check on Susan and Susan is suspicious of that at first, but Edie insists that she knows what it's like to have your heart stomped on. So she really cares about Susan. It's a beautiful moment. It's probably the second time in the series we actually get to see them be friends. So they kind of teamed up once. That's when they went to the bar together to snoop on Mike. But this is the second time and they are again coming together over Mike and they want to get to the bottom of this mystery. So they decide they are going to snoop on Paul Young. Now, because Paul was selling his house, Edie still has a key from him. So they sneak into the house when Paul is gone. While in the house, they find the tape that Paul was watching, which confirms her name is Angela and Felicia Tillman was a nurse. They don't really put that part of it together. They just realize that there are secrets in this family um, and they didn't used to live here. And a lot of this, by the way, is complete news to Edie because remember, she's not really part of the inner circle of gossip. So while Susan and Brie and Gabby and Lynette are getting all the latest on developing situations, Edie's totally left out of the dark. So she's like, wait a minute, who's Angela? Um, and this is a chance when Susan catches her up a little bit. While they are watching the tape, Paul gets home and the women hide behind the couch. But Edie ends up coming out because they're going to be caught. She has to cover somehow. And she tries to seduce Paul and that's her explanation for being in the house. They end up kissing and then Susan is able to sneak away and Edie gets out of the house without having to do anything more with Paul, thank God. Finally, at the end of the episode, Susan and Mike make up again. Episode 17. I don't have a ton on Lynette's little C plot here, but I want to note that Marley Matlin guest stars in this episode and that she is so delightful and fun. And I wish that she was in more than one episode. Okay, let's start with Brie. So Andrew gets expelled from school because he was hotboxing in his car. And then when he was caught... <laughs> The security guy like grabbed the car and Andrew just kept driving and so they get expelled. And Rex and Bree decide to send him to a rehabilitation camp. We're gonna put that on hold for right now. So put a pin in that. Mama Solis wakes up from her coma and she gets out of bed. She's frantic, she's looking around and then she falls down the stairs and dies. And just like that, we have death number three. At Mama Solis's funeral, Andrew shows absolutely no remorse whatsoever. He does not even seem affected by the situation. 
So that is kind of the final straw that Rex and Bree need to decide to send Andrew to rehabilitation camp. Before the funeral, they had talked about possibly doing something like that, but Andrew did not like the idea, of course, and he kicked Bree. This time, Rex and Bree wake Andrew up in the middle of the night to send him to camp, and there are people there to escort him, and Andrew spits in Bree's face on his way out. Gabby, meanwhile, is upset because the funeral was very, very expensive. It wasn't just a typical funeral and, like, an inexpensive casket or anything. Carlos went above and beyond for his mama. He put forward every expense possible. There's like horses at this funeral. It's crazy. When Gabby got the call that Juanita had died, she is smirking on the phone. It's so fucking sick, girl. <laughs> and then she comforts Carlos, but we see him and her hug and Gabby is like smiling because her secret now about the affair is completely safe. And Carlos has been offered a plea deal and it would mean he has to do eight months in prison, but they would get to keep everything. And Gabby really wants him to take it because she wants him to show her the same respect that he showed Juanita. And Carlos does not want to take the deal. Then Gabby goes to the hospital to have a little meeting. And the reason that Juanita fell down the stairs, as we see at the start of the episode, is because a nurse was not paying attention. I think they're also pretty understaffed, but yeah, the nurse was like sitting in the stairwell with her headphones on and having a cigarette. So there is some negligence going on, but the lawyer for the hospital offers $1.6 million as a condolence acknowledgement and to ensure that Gabby and Carlos will not sue the hospital. Carlos does agree to take the plea deal, but only on the condition that Gabby promises she will be there for him when he gets out. Now, he does not know that Gabby signed this $1.6 million agreement. And as far as Gabby knows, once he takes the plea deal, Gabby can then cash the check and they won't lose the money because it won't have been assets that were earned before he went to prison. So Gabby decides not to tell him about the $1.6 million. There's this great monologue that Edie has about how much she hates Susan. And when I was watching it, I just really felt connected to Edie for no particular reason. But Edie is talking about how Susan pushes her buttons. And I can imagine myself like in my, my deepest, darkest dream showing up at Mark Cherry's door and saying the same thing. Mike writes Susan a letter explaining everything about his past and hoping that it will lead her to forgive him for not being totally honest with her because Susan is still really iffy about the whole thing. Um, but Susan doesn't even trust him enough to read the letter, so she just returns the unopened letter to him. Episode 18. The cops show up to ask Paul Young about the toy chest because they have identified him in the list of receipts from the carpenter and they want to ask him some questions about it. So Zach is also standing nearby when the detectives come and he tells the cops he does recognize the chest, but they got rid of it years ago because it broke. So he covers Paul's ass there. The cops tell them that a woman's body was found in the box, so it's very important that they get accurate information. Zach privately confronts Paul to ask him about the woman in the box because on the night at the school dance, when Paul started to tell Zach more about how he was wrong and he didn't hurt anyone, what he did tell Zach was that when he was really little, a woman came and tried to take them away, uh, Zach away, and they couldn't let that happen. So that's what we as the audience learn now is that the woman in the box is the woman who came to try and take Zach away from Paul and Mary Alice. This is the first time, though, it would seem that Zach is getting information that his parents really did kill someone. And then for the audience, it is information that Zach and Mary Alice Young killed someone, that she is in a box, and that Zach knew that somebody came to try and take him. Makes sense. Zach doesn't know everything, though. There's still a lot of missing pieces for Zach, just as there is for the audience, which really helps the whole thing because it makes Paul just seem even more creepy. Like 
He's keeping so much from his own son. We've seen Paul keeping secrets from Zach all season. So there was him digging stuff in the middle of the night. But even in the next episode, when we have Zach upset that Paul didn't get an obituary for Mary Alice, well, now we know that he might not have done that because of the fact her real name was Angela and he didn't want any attention being brought to her if they were trying to have this secret life. But that day, Felicia asked Zach for some help bringing in her groceries and they sit and talk a little bit. Felicia tells Zach that she knew Mary Alice when they both lived in Utah together and Felicia says that she'll tell him a secret too. She remembers him when he was a baby. She also says, want to know what else? I remember your original name. It was lovely. The name was Dana. So Zach is Dana. Zach is the baby we all thought was dead the whole time. And like, yeah, Paul told us Dana is very much alive, but we don't know what that means. I don't know. I think when I was 14, I was watching this. I was like, oh my God, what if Dana is actually Julie? Like, there are so many things that could have happened there, but yeah. I have a pet snake, and she just, like, her body flopped against the inside of her tank. It scared the fuck out of me. Oh, my God. In this episode, Susan's mom shows up, and she is such a hot mess. There's three episodes of this storyline, or four, where her mom's in town, and she's, like, flirting with guys and bringing guys home, and... She's trying to go out on double dates with Susan, and the whole thing is just annoying, so I'm not even going to break down plot by plot about who goes out with who, because I don't care, you don't care, Susan doesn't care, Susan can't stand her mom either, but at least it kind of helps us see why Susan is the way she is. Like, her mom is also a hot mess, so truly good for Julie for breaking the cycle, because she's getting good grades, she has a good head on her shoulders, she's doing good. Another child, however, Mr. Andrew Vandekamp, is not doing so good. Bree and Rex go to visit him at Camp Hennessy. Andrew only wants to see Rex, though, and he only wants Rex in on the family therapy session. So Bree waits outside as requested, but she does end up going into the session near the very end, and Rex tells Bree, Bree, Andrew just told me he thinks he might be gay. We are reminded that Carlos has been tampering with Gabby's birth control for months. Carlos is pissed that Gabby didn't tell him about the settlement. Before Carlos takes the plea deal now, he wants Gabby to sign an updated post-nup. She refuses to sign it, and he physically makes her sign it. Like, he grabs her and makes her sign the thing. And she is crying, and then she goes to John for comfort, and they end up hooking up again for the first time in months. Episode 19, Brie wants to bring Andrew home from Camp Hennessy because she thinks the worst place for him to be to focus on his well-being is at a camp full of 200 boys after she just found out he's gay. So they decide to bring him home from camp and instead set up some Christian counseling for him. Rex accuses Brie of being upset that Andrew is gay and she insists that she may be freaked out, but it doesn't change how she feels about him. And then later she reassures Andrew, Andrew, I would love you even if you were a murderer. It goes, um, in Bree's world, it goes like this. Um, liberals, murderers, gay. So Bree hosts a family dinner for the family and their priest, and the priest starts talking to Andrew about finding God so he will no longer be gay and things like that. And Andrew says he is not interested and he is just fine with being gay. And so the priest doesn't really push it. And he tells Bree that if Andrew doesn't want to change, there's nothing that he can do. Andrew goes to the church to talk to the priest privately. And he tells the priest that he is not actually gay. He just told Bree that and told Rex that to make them upset. And in fact, he is going to behave so, so well moving forward that his mom is going to think that she has raised this perfect little angel. And then when she least expects it, he's going to do something so awful, it will completely destroy her. This is a sick, sick little boy. <laughs> and I just want to remind you, all of this 
drama between Brie and Andrew has been going on long before she found out he was gay. Like, they've been fighting since episode two, and he has been talking back to her and sabotaging her, and he kicked her and spit in her face. All of that context is important later on. In this episode, Mrs. McCluskey takes a fall and she needs help getting to the doctor, so Lynette helps her out. They become pretty good friends in this episode, and Lynette is always around to help Mrs. McCluskey when she needs it. Mrs. McCluskey is still cranky all the time and like yells at Lynette and stuff, but it's sweet and she still really needs Lynette's help. So it's an unlikely friendship, but this is an episode where we get to see more of that develop. Gabby continues sleeping with John and Carlos realizes that Gabby is still getting eyed by other men and he is worried about what might happen when he goes to prison. So in order to try to make Gabby happy and in order to protect their marriage, he tears up the post-snap agreement. Noah tells Mike that they have found Deirdre's body. She was in a chest and she has been dead for 15 years. Noah paid a cop to get them off of Mike's back about the Martha Huber thing, but he tells him he still needs to be careful. And now they're going to give Mike the file about what they found so far about Deirdre. So Mike goes to pick up the file from a cop, and the cop beats him up and calls him a cop killer. But he does get the file on Deirdre, at least. And then Mike finds Paul's name in the list of materials in the file. So... We draw attention to the wall. This is Deirdre right here, Noah's daughter. And now we know that she is indeed the person who is in the box and she has been dead for 15 years. So I'm going to go ahead and pay my respects. And just like that, we have our fourth death of the series. She died 15 years ago, but because we just found out it is indeed her in the chest. Moment of silence, please. We are in episode 20 now. Here we go. Paul confronts Edie about the break-in at his house, and he says that some of the stuff was moved around. So this includes the tape, because when they found it and then Paul walked in, they like stuffed it behind the couch cushion. Edie tells him that Susan made her do it, which is correct. And that Susan wanted answers because there's all this stuff about a dead baby and the name Angela. And she tells Paul that she would warn Susan about telling Paul if she liked her more, but she doesn't. So now there's a target on Susan's back. We also see a flashback revealing that Martha Huber knew all about the Mary Alice Angela thing. Um, they chatted about it together one time when Martha was visiting. Felicia tells Martha that Mary Alice had a patient who um, just had a baby and then she disappeared. And then shortly after that, the baby disappeared too. Paul talks to Susan about the Mary Alice dead baby Angela situation and says that Mary Alice changed her name because Angela was a name that she was given in honor of one of her aunts, but she had a big falling out with her aunt and she decided she didn't want to have her name anymore. So she changed it. And Susan is like, Oh, okay. Paul also says that he hopes that Susan will leave him and Zach alone from now on. Over in the Meyer household, Julie and Zach have broken up for sure. And that night, Susan's house bursts into flames. The kitchen burns down. And at first, um, her mom is blamed for it, for like leaving a candle on. But we later find out that um, Zach burnt it down. Uh, we see him standing with a lighter, and yeah, he burnt down Susan's kitchen because he's mad at Julie. George asks Bree out to an event as friends, and since it's just as friends, Bree agrees to go with him. Rex wants Bree to stay away from George, though, because it seems like George still has some feelings for Bree. So Bree decides to tell George that she can't go to the event with him, and she apologizes, and he says it's okay because... He has a girlfriend from the pharmacy anyway, so it will all work out. Um, he does not have a girlfriend, in fact, at the pharmacy. He just doesn't want to seem like a complete loser to Bree, so he wrangles one of his co-workers to come to this event with him, and she is so over it, but she's kind of uh, flaky-seeming, so she goes to the event. Bree does 
end up continuing being friends with George, though, even though Rex told her not to. In this episode, there is a little less than paradise in the Scavo household. Lynette finds out that Tom has been working with his ex-girlfriend for months now. So he gave her the job at this agency because he just felt bad that um, he had cheated on her before. And for reference, he cheated on his ex-girlfriend with Lynette. So it was forever ago, but he still wanted to do the right thing and make sure that she had a job in the area since she moved there. And yeah, Lynette is not very happy about this relationship, though. So Tom tells her that it feels like Lynette is desperately looking for something wrong. And she's so desperate to find something wrong in the marriage that she's willing to push Tom out of it altogether. Gabby starts suffering from morning sickness. She goes and takes a pregnancy test, and she freaks out when she sees the result. So Gabby starts trying to figure out how this happened. She sees that her birth control pills have been tampered with, and she, very rightfully, is pissed beyond belief. Gabby ends up telling Susan she's pregnant, but that she doesn't know who the father is. So Gabby could be having a baby with either Carlos or with John. Now, Mike asks Susan to stay away from Paul because he's potentially dangerous. Susan doesn't really know who to trust at this point because Mike killed someone, but also Paul seems creepy and off. Something is wrong with both of them. So whose side should she really pick here? So Susan decides to hire a private investigator to figure out what's going on with Paul. And I want to note that it is the same private investigator who Paul hired earlier to figure out what was up with the letter. Episode 21. The PI tells Paul that Susan hired him, and together they create a lie to get Susan off their trail. So PI has a little more loyalty towards Paul at this point. But since the Paul thing has nothing weird going on, Susan asks the PI to look into the Mike situation instead. And she gets a little bit of information. Um, she learned that the person that Mike killed was a cop. And within the photos in the file, she sees pictures of Mike with Noah and Kendra. So Susan goes to visit Noah and Kendra at their big fancy house. And um, Noah and Kendra tell Susan not to look into this because it's dangerous. Noah tells Susan there's nothing more to the story. It's just... Mike killed a cop, and that's that. But Kendra runs out and sits in Susan's car with her and tells her the full truth, which is that Deirdre was a drug addict, and there was a time when they were, like, set up, and the cop was going to kill Deirdre, so Mike killed the cop to protect her. And this makes Susan swoon because Mike killed someone, yes, but he did it to protect Deirdre, and what a good man for doing so. So Susan and Mike make up again. In the Vandekamp household, Rex has begun feeling more and more ill in the past few weeks. So as a reminder, he has medication from the pharmacy that George is possibly tampering with. And as the episodes progress in the second half of the season, he starts feeling more and more tired and worn down all the time. Bree is giving him his medication every day. She's taking care of him. She is cooking for him and cleaning for him, just like their marriage is totally fine. Zach is also really sick. Paul keeps making him drink some sort of tea. It's very Crimson Peak, if you ask me. Like, dude, just stop drinking the fucking tea. Obviously, it's making you sick. But Felicia um, goes over to the young house and finds Zach basically unconscious and helps him over to her house instead. She also finds a bottle of tranquilizers in the young house kitchen. So, yeah, Paul presumably has been drugging Zach. When Paul goes over to Felicia's to get Zach and bring him home, Felicia tells Paul that she knows from her sister's diaries all about the Mary Alice situation and all about the baby and the fact that Zach is Dana, and she tells Paul that Dana, Zach, will be living with her from now on. And last but not least, 
Carlos blames his mother for tampering with the birth control because she wanted a grandchild so badly, but Gabby is able to look into the records from the health insurance, and she sees that the birth control was not tampered with until after she was already in a coma. Episode 22. The voiceover at the start of this episode is genius. Mary Alice says, and I want to quote this correctly, in the last year, their street had played host to violence, arson, blackmail, and murder. <laughs> okay, Paul drops off a box of things for Zach and a note. Um, he wants Zach to know that he did not leave on his own accord, and he wants to meet with him later. Mike asks Susan to move in with him, and they have a little bit of a disagreement at first because Susan doesn't want to move Julie you know, there's already been a whole divorce and there's just a lot going on for Julie. So she doesn't want to make her move into Mike's. So in the episode, they decide to start moving Mike's stuff over into Susan's house. Bree realizes that George does indeed still have romantic feelings for her. And George breaks into the Vanda Camp household, goes through her things. His goal in the house is to swap out Rex's medication he does that, but then he also goes to Bree's closet, and in the closet, he finds a box of sex toys and adult things, and it becomes clear to George what kind of things Rex and possibly Bree, by extension, is really into. Then, George tells Bree that Rex told some doctors, and he overheard them talking about his interests in the bedroom, which leaves Bree beyond pissed and humiliated, that really is the final straw for her. And remember, Rex has not actually told anyone about this. George is just telling Bree that he did. Anyways, Rex has another heart attack. He tells Bree he's having another heart attack during their argument. And Bree is like, okay, I will take you to the hospital. And she really takes her time. She's like, making the bed and making everything all nice and neat before she'll take him and Rex goes and sits on the stairs and Danielle asks what's wrong because he is like not breathing very well and he's in pain obviously and he says that he's having a heart attack he's waiting for Brie to drive him and Danielle freaks out she runs upstairs she's like daddy is having a heart attack are you going to drive him or not it's not good over there Gabby finds a letter from the insurance company and it confirms that Carlos is the one who swapped out the medication. He basically ordered a 90 day supply of it so that he could tamper with all of it at once. And this leaves Gabby very upset. So she leaves the house. Uh, she's going to leave for a night. And Carlos tells her she can't leave because a baby needs a mother and a father. And Gabby says, oh, Carlos, whoever told you you were the father? And then she drives off and Carlos tries to run and chase her, but his ankle monitor starts beeping so he can't chase her very far. But he does end up getting into his own car and following her to John's apartment. And Justin is also there. Now, since Justin is the one who he sees leaving the apartment, he assumes that Justin is the one Gabby's had an affair with. So he goes in and beats Justin up. Um, which means for the second time this season, Carlos has committed a hate crime on accident. Felicia Tillman tells Mike all about the information she has on Paul Young and about the Mary Alice situation. And he asks why she didn't give it to the cops. And Felicia explains that the justice system isn't enough for the punishment that Paul deserves. Mike keeps Martha's journal and Susan finds out about the contents of it. She discovers that Martha Hoover was the one blackmailing Mary Alice all along. And finally, in this penultimate episode of season one, a new family moves on to Wisteria Lane. I'm going to wait to talk about them until season two because the season two mystery revolves around them. So I want to wait because there's, I cannot stress how much there is to say about their storyline. So we'll put a pin in that and you will hear about them first thing, season two, episode one. The time has come for the season one finale of Desperate Housewives. The finale, for your reference, was watched by 30.6 million people. People were seated for this, okay? They had no, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. 
As always, we start with a voiceover for Mary Alice, and this is a flashback. So we have Deirdre showing up at her door, and just to recap for you, Mary Alice Young was a nurse in Utah, and Deirdre shows up at her door, and she has her baby, and she shows up to ask Mary Alice for some money to buy drugs. She even offers to sell Mary Alice her baby, because she knows Mary Alice can't have a child of her own. That's how desperate Deirdre is at this point. So Mary Alice was desperate enough to have a baby that she was willing to purchase Dana from Deirdre. And she and Paul and baby Dana slash Zach move to Wisteria Lane and they think everything is okay. And then one day Deirdre shows up and knocks on Mary Alice's front door and to quote Mary Alice, I was desperate once again. After the intro of the show plays, we leave the flashback, but we'll get back into it later. In the modern day, Zach is staying with Felicia, and he demands to know where his father is. Felicia says she doesn't know because he left, and Zach freaks out, and he hits Felicia on the head, and she falls unconscious. Zach thinks that Mike has something to do with where his father went, so... When Susan goes into Mike's to grab something, remember they're moving in together and Susan is helping Mike with all that, Zach is waiting in there for her with a gun and he holds her hostage. Zach explains to her that he plans to kill Mike because Mike took Paul somewhere and might be killing him. In the Van de Kamp drama, Bree finds out that Rex needs surgery after his second heart attack and while they have a quiet moment together, Bree tells Rex that she's really sorry for all of the terrible things that have happened between them. The second heart attack has really helped put things into perspective, and she wants to put all of the terrible things from the past behind them, and she says the best is yet to come. Then, Rex gets some results from his blood test from the doctor, and it states that his potassium levels are very, very high. He thinks it's got to be something that he is ingesting, and he asks who cooks Rex's food for him, and he explains that it's his wife, Bree. So the doctor thinks that maybe Bree has been poisoning Rex. Rex writes a note to Bree saying that he understands and he forgives her. So, as far as Rex is concerned, Bree did all this. He has no reason to suspect George, even though George was indeed the one poisoning him via tampering with his medications. Bree is trying to get through the day, so she is cleaning around the house. She's polishing her wedding silver, and then she gets a call from the hospital, and she says, Oh, I thought the surgery wasn't until tomorrow. Is everything okay? And the doctor informs her that Rex has passed away. This scene is so sad because we're really watching Brie try so hard to keep it together. And she just like sits back down at her table and continues polishing the wedding silver while she cries. Okay, it's okay. All right, let's talk about the Scavos season one wrap up. Remember how Lynette had meddled in Tom's job? Well, he ended up not getting the promotion after all. So he quits and he decides that since Lynette seems so badly to one, hate what she's doing and two, wants to get involved with all of his issues at work, that maybe she should be the one working. So Tom announces he is going to be a stay-at-home dad and Lynette can go back to work. For the Solises, John shows up to court when Carlos is being charged for hate crimes and he tells Carlos about the affair. And finally, on to the wrap-up for Mike. Mike takes Paul Young out to a remote area and says it's not about Martha Hoover. He doesn't really care that Paul very likely killed Martha Hoover. What he does care about is Deirdre, and he shows Paul a picture of Deirdre. And that's when we, the audience, finally get to see the truth of what happened that night. The night in question is when Deirdre shows up at the end of the flashback and Mary Alice says she was desperate once again. Deirdre shows up and she's ready to take Zach back. She says that she is sober and she's clean and she's ready to be a mom. Deirdre is desperate to take Zach back. Mary Alice and Paul don't believe her that she's clean 
and she is about to run upstairs and go physically grab Zach. And she also, it seems, is planning to like press charges against the family. And it is important to remember here that Noah is loaded, so she would probably be pretty successful. Also, like they fucking bought a baby. And I know there's some like real world commentary here, and I don't really want to get into all of that right this second. Mary Alice is a nurse, and instead of actually trying to help Deirdre through this very difficult moment, she bought her baby. Deirdre starts running towards the stairs so she can grab Zach. And Mary Alice stabs her, and Deirdre collapses. And Paul says, Oh, Mary Alice, what did you do? And I guess we know that she got a little desperate. We see Zach coming down the stairs and he sees like all the blood and it just, he doesn't know who she is or what had happened. He had just heard the shouting and saw the blood and heard go back to bed, Zach. So he's kind of been left out of the loop. But I can't fucking imagine how traumatizing it would be to get this new context about what happened that night and know that like one, your parents purchased you and two, that they murdered your biological mother um mike is stunned when paul reveals everything that happened that night with the youngs and deirdre because this is the first time he realizes that deirdre had a baby and he asks deirdre had a baby it's like mike why do you think they killed her like did he not know anything about this dana i guess he just assumed that zach slash Dana was biologically the young's child. But when you look at like the timeline of everything, they had a baby and then the baby disappeared. And then a few years later, Deirdre died. I don't know, Mike, like put two and two together. I think Mike needs to read a few Agatha Christie novels. I can recommend a few in particular. Um, I think Mike should read The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side and Postern of Fate. Yeah, those two are all that come to mind for now. But Mirror Crack from Side to Side is, I'm not going to get into all this, but the Mirror Crack from Side to Side is a really fun book, and I think Mike should read it. Anyways, Mike does not kill Paul Young. I think it hits him that one, oh, wait, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on a second. Okay, every time I watch this season, I'm like, oh, Mike cares so much for Zach in episode six or seven when he gives him his card and says he can call him whenever mike cares so much because he knows that zach is deirdre's baby but obviously he actually didn't i feel silly now i feel silly now i guess mike's just a good guy who's concerned about a kid because he doesn't even know that paul was responsible for deirdre or martha hoover yet right Anyways, if you have any thoughts on Mike in particular, feel free to uh, leave a little comment. We can discuss Mr. Delfino all you want. Mary Alice has a voice over her closing moment. She says, I not only watch, I cheer them on, these amazing women. And the season ends with Mike entering his house where Zach is holding Susan captive with a gun. And that's it. That's a wrap. I do have a few concluding thoughts on season one. So first of all, I think season one might be my favorite season of the show. Um, there are parts of season three I love that would definitely put it up there. But there are also some things about season three I fucking hate, so it will not be up there. In terms of mystery, season one is by far the strongest in my humble opinion. It just has the most pieces that all come together. And... I think it is brilliant. I want to talk a little more now about the, what the colors on the wall mean. And obviously this will mean that you'll kind of have some spoilers going into season two if you look at the colors, but since some colors mean more than one thing, it's okay. Anyways, so red represents murder and only murder because red is a very bold color. I don't want to confuse murder with anything else. So we have the murder here and Paul Young and Martha Huber, and then George and Rex. And yeah, that's it for the murder. And then orange represents other forms of violence. So things including, but not limited to, um, bodily harm, um, 
a hit and run, tampering with birth control medication. If it's significant as a plot and someone like punches someone, that is going in there. The hate crimes that Carlos accidentally commits, all that stuff is in the orange. Blue lines represent a work-related relationship. So that might mean someone who a character hires or if two people are or were colleagues or know each other through work. For example, I have Felicia Tillman and Mary Alice Young are connected by a blue and then um, Noah and Mike are connected by this light blue. The darker green lines represent information that one has that puts them in some sort of power over the other and sometimes blackmail. Susan knows that Andrew's gay. Paul knows about Mike being arrested. Juanita knows about Gabby's affair, etc. The purple lines, which you'll see in just a few places, those represent a marriage um, or a former marriage. The pink lines represent a romance. So this occurs whether it is an affair or an ongoing romantic relationship, or if it's significant enough and disrupts things enough, then even just a kiss or a few dates might be considered this. The lime green lines represent a significant change in a platonic relationship. Sometimes it means they find out their family members. What else? What other line is there? So the dark green lines are for information someone holds over someone. The lighter green lines, as shown here, represent people conspiring together. So they both hold the information and they would probably both equally be in trouble if someone were to figure it out. So for example, Julie helping Zach hide in her house, that gets a light green line. And then the Vanda Camps covering up the hit and run, they're all in on that. So they all get this light green line. And then I see a dark blue line next to Mike, but I don't remember what that means. Hold on. What did Mike do to Carl? And finally, a dark blue line represents someone framing another character for a crime. You know what happened? And this is where I think I fucked something up because I have this line here between Mike and Carl, but like Carl never, I think Carl in my notes was meant to be Paul. When I fixed the wall for season two, I'm also going to change that if I can. It's kind of buried, but I'm going to make it happen. Some things on the wall could be considered more than one thing. So, for example, with Gabby, I gave her and John a pink line for a fair, but, like, I could definitely make an argument for there being an orange line between them instead. But because the way that it's presented to us is an affair, that's what I decided to put here. And the same thing with Maisie Gibbons and Rex. I debated, but I ultimately went with a pink line for affair because at the end of the day, it is the affair that Brie finds out about first and is more upset about. It's presented to us as an affair. So although he's hiring her, it could be a blue line. I decided to go with the pink one for that. But yeah, if I miss anything um, that you feel is important for season one, feel free to leave a comment down below. I am going to go ahead and set up the wall for season two now. I'm very excited to dive into a new season. Um, and I think that's everything I have to say.